early as 2004, the financial regulator was expressing serious concern about the way the building society was run. The regulator complained of an over-reliance on the managing director and the absence of a senior executive to oversee the commercial lending function. His greatest concern was the serious weaknesses in commercial lending. The regulator cites a KPMG report, also obtained by Primetime, which said that joint ventures undertaken for many millions had no formal due diligence undertaken. It damningly says there was a lack of formal monitoring procedures and documentation on such ventures and a failure to have legal agreements fully signed before deals. It highlights the shortened lead time for loan approval as one of the potential risks of commercial loans. Most alarmingly, the KPMG report complained that the bank's internal auditors lacked the expertise to properly analyse commercial lending. Well, you're into the area of fundamental weakening of what is the strength of good lending and good practice and therefore you're you're imperiling the situation for the collectability of those loans while nationwide took some measures in response to the regulator we now see the result of nationwide's lending policies 8.3 billion of property and related loans are being transferred to the national asset management agency yet while all the maverick lending should have looked dangerous to anyone who remembered previous property crashes, experts denied there was a problem and few dissenting voices got through. Back in the autumn of 2007, I started to look at Irish bank lending. And what I saw terrified me. What I saw was that Irish banks were lending as much to builders and developers as Japanese banks had before they crashed in 1990. Morgan Kelly wrote an article in the Irish Times that property overexposure could bring down the banks. It was attacked by government representatives. They too believed in the property miracle. We're providing new houses at a much faster rate than other countries. So thankfully, Count Corlea, um, unlike uh, large parts of the rest of Europe, uh, our people are, are buying houses. What we had in Ireland was effectively groupthink, that we had this credit boom, this building boom, we were getting rich. It was heresy to, reject, to say that anything could go wrong with this. In particular, this went right up to the very top. Sitting on the sidelines or on the fence, cribbing and moaning is a lost opportunity. In fact, I don't know how people who engage in that uh, don't commit suicide. Because <laughs> the suggestion that the Irish banks could collapse seemed outrageous and irresponsible. But it turned out to be correct, unfortunately. I saw a headline recently saying, economy to collapse. You know, I can't remember which wizard wrote it or said it, but I mean, imagine up an economy collapsing and, and it's going by 6%. Coming up in part two, we see how the bank crash happened, exposing the failure of regulation and how, unlike top bankers, the rest of us now pay for the cost of the crisis. By enforcing their prescription, they would have saved the Irish banking system. Bankers haven't paid any price at all. They've, they've been rewarded. Good morning, Mr. Fitzpatrick. It's Amy Smith here from RT Primetime.